Good morning everyone and welcome to the second day of the 50th Liber annual conference held virtually this year from Belgrade, Serbia. My name is Vanja Kovacev and I am your local host reporting live from Belgrade. Each day our main program is broadcasted from a different Serbian library. Yesterday we were at the University Library and today we have the great honor to be at the Library of the National Assembly of Serbia. This small but very beautiful library is a special library jam hidden within the building of National Assembly of Serbia and we obtained a special permit to enter. It opened its doors for the first time to a more general public for this great occasion, namely for the 50th Liber Annual Conference. So please appreciate this VIP privilege and follow us throughout the day two of the Liber Conference as we will report live from this small but magnificent Belgrade library. Hello, good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this LIBER 2021 online session today. We will have our second keynote speaker in this conference. My name is Agnes Ponsati, and I'm director of the unit of information resources for research at the Spanish National Research Council. I'm also a member of the LIBER Executive Board, and I will share the session today. Before we start, some ground rules to keep in mind. Uh, we will be running a live questions and answer at the end of this session. If you want to ask any question to our uh, keynote speaker, please send it through the chat window at any time. Following the online conference, uh, you will also receive a short survey. And we kindly ask you to spend some time to answer it. We welcome your feedback. Finally, if you missed anything, don't worry, because the session will be recorded and we will provide the proper link to see it again, just in case. In today's session, we will hear a presentation from Professor Eva Mendez. Open knowledge, darling, we need to talk again. And before she starts the presentation, I would like to give a short bio of Professor Eva Mendez. She holds a PhD in Library and Information Sciences and is an expert in metadata. She defines herself as an open knowledge militant. She has been professor at University Carlos III in Madrid at the Library and Information Science Department since 1997. She has been an active member of several international research teams, advisory boards, and communities, including DCMI, Open Air, Metadata 2020, Research Data Alliance, and many others. She has taken part in and led several research projects and acted as advisor in the fields related with standardization, metadata, semantic web, open data, digital repositories, and libraries, in addition to information policies for uh, development in several countries. She is currently Deputy Vice President for Scientific Policy Open Science at University Carlos III in Madrid, and she is member of the European Open Science Policy Platform on behalf of Yero and she has been the OSPP chair. It's the second consecutive year that LIBER delivers its annual conference online in an effort to bring our community together while also remaining safe. We hope this session runs smoothly, but we ask for your questions in case we uh, have any technical glitches. And now I'm very happy to turn the stage over to Eva Mendez 
for her talk, Open Knowledge, Darling, we need to talk again. Thank you, and Eva, the Thank floor you. is yours. Thank you very much, Agnes, for your kind presentation. I will start sharing my screen. I think you can see it now. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Lever for giving me this opportunity to be the keynote speaker for today's session. And let me start uh, uh, just congratulating uh, um, Lever because Lever is even older than the web. And also um, is in the 50th, uh, the conference is in the 50th birthday. That means that if Lever was a person, can get vaccinated and travel around the world. Let's think that this is going to happen next year. I would like to be in, in Serbia today, but it's a pleasure to be with you online when even it's more challenging, when I don't see your faces and, and I, I cannot tell you why we need to talk again. So um, when I was conceiving this, this talk, I was thinking in a previous talk that that it was uh, um, in, in, in something, well, let, let me say it first, what is my position? Because Agnes gave a, a kind of a nice introduction of my bio and stuff, but it can be, I can have many hats. But today, let me tell you that I will have my best favorite hat, which is the hat of a researcher, because I'm a librarian by training, but I'm a researcher in library science and, and in meta science. And, and I think today, of course, I will just talk to librarians that from the researcher's perspective, in the terms that I think we have challenges together, like the open knowledge is, is, uh, is, um, is today in, in the front line. But the point is that I want to tell you that this is the perspective so you can understand some of my concerns and my points of view. This is a bit of the outline of the talk. Um, I would like to have a reflection uh, why we are from open science to open knowledge because the first time when, when they invite me to give this keynote, I look at the, uh, the lay motif of this year conference and I say open knowledge, that's a very interesting uh, challenge, which is yet another uh, way of talking about open science, open access and open uh, initiatives that we are really um, facing every day in the 21st century. And also would like to give you um, this, this vision of implementation and why I think is a game, okay? And uh, at the end, I will just have a picture of where we are now in open science and open knowledge and what we want to be because um, in the last uh, final report of the European Open Science Policy Platform that we finished last year in April and it was presented in, in May to the Competitiveness Council, we have these new expectations for the open science in 2030 and we we start just uh, calling the open knowledge system, which is kind of the same thing, but more inclusive. Let me reflect about all of this with you today. So I was thinking that the title of my, my talk, provocative enough, uh, it's coming from um, the previous keynote that I gave in, in March, 2019, in Berlin, in the Open Science Conference that I say open science that I wanted to talk because at the moment it was when I was taking the chairing of the open science policy platform. And my big endeavor there was talking to everybody, talking to every stakeholder, to the librarians, to the researchers, to the research performing organizations. Why not to the publishers? Because they are in the middle of the picture. But at that time, I was just thinking that we need to talk, we need to reflect together, but what I have to, to think with, uh, with you today is why we have to talk again. What I said always is that uh, when somebody tells you, uh, darling, we need to talk, you know that something is going to change. You never know if it is going to be the, the quarters of the living room or you have to change your relationship or you have to change the house, but something has to change. But the point is that when somebody tells you we need to talk again, the point is that it didn't change much. So that's why I want to talk to you again about open knowledge and open science and open science with this new, um, new um, hat of open, open knowledge. In general terms, we have been thinking so many years that open science is an umbrella term. Here you have different representations. 
But uh, if you look at the how people refer to open science, it depends of the of the country. For example, in in the United States, they start talking about open science, but just no far away. It was before open access. Then in some other uh, regions like Australia or the of the uh, uh, Oceania, they are talking about open scholarship. But in general, the only difference is that when we include open educational materials, we call open knowledge because it's more inclusive. And when we talk about uh, open um, educational materials, we can just think about MOOCs also and people they interpret that is open science. Uh, you can also have that open science has different elements. And the point is that it's not about how we talk about it. It's just a, about a branding. I say that open science is a brand that we understand the same things underneath that. And the new uh, recommendations of the UNESCO that they were approved in May and they will be probably approved for the 193 countries in November this year, probably that will just set up this way to call open science with the same concept. But let me make a reflection because sometimes when you think about science, and that's why in the open science policy platform, many times we were thinking that it's better and more inclusive to call open knowledge because open knowledge includes also open education and the relationship with open education and citizen science and massive open education with MOOCs and citizen science, but also is more inclusive. Because when you say science, people think that we are talking about the same sciences, uh, physics, chemistry, mathematics, engineering, stuff like that. So that's why sometimes we have separate umbrellas for open science. And when we talk about social sciences and science, but also I think it's a question of understanding. I found this, um, this new umbrella, which is open knowledge. I didn't find any umbrella with open knowledge in English that is in Spanish, but at the end, we are talking about the same. And when it comes to open research, it's kind of um, more, uh, I think I, I, at some point, if it was today, I will prefer to call open research because open research just is more meaningful on the process of the cycle of research. And open science probably is about the results and open access about the way we access to the results. And never mind, uh, you know that I have my own interpretation of the open science and I, I transformed the, the, the uh, umbrella in a, in a mushroom because I wanted to have roots. And this is the funniest joke that I always make. That is the, it's a biologically incorrect mushroom because the mushrooms, they don't have roots and such, but they have something on the, on the land, something on the soil. And the soil is the responsible research and innovation. And we think uh, that we have only elements, but if we don't have strong roots to make this trend happen, it's never going to happen. We need very strong research infrastructures with the strongest standards, with the strong metadata, with the strong uh, uh, governance processes. And also we need a new reward system, which is something that I want to talk about a bit later. So we can just uh, think over, which is the real bottleneck of open knowledge. And we need a new system of research integrity. But in this context, the responsible research and innovation, the soil where the, the open science or open knowledge should flourish is based on the openness. So for me, at the end, the openness is like a Swiss, uh, a Swiss um, uh, knife that you have different elements. And this is what librarians feel, that you have the openness out there. And you have to deal with open data, with open research, with open content, now with open cloud business, and also even though open government, because sometimes open knowledge also includes open government. And also this, the European Directive 10, um, um, 10, uh, 24, uh, in, in 2019 was including under the public sector information open research data. So at the end, it's all together and we need to deal with all these tools to engage and to solve problems in the new context of the openness, which is the new landscape. But what I want to, to think about, uh, I want to refer that we are in an open ecosystem where the open government, open education, open data, open research and open licensing, which is a crucial element and sometimes uh, we forget about the IPR issues, that they are kind of a core business in the middle of the whole situation of the openness. 
Now, for example, in terms of open data, the European Commission opened a consultation to, um, to think about the, the sui generis law on the protection of the databases, to think about if we can open it up more data unless they are in the, in the databases or whatever. So this is a crucial thing that is crucial scenario with this open ecosystem, we have to juggle in, we have to do like Chinese plates and, and just try to, to figure out what the libraries have to do, and what the researchers can be substantially uh, helped by the librarians. So when I saw this, um, this um, title for the conference, Libraries and Open Knowledge from Vision to Implementation, I thought, what are the new things on the picture nowadays in the open knowledge? We were thinking in open knowledge institutions, for example, I thought, uh, I think that uh, you, you have yesterday a presentation from Koki community, which is the uh, community of open knowledge institutions that is based on a working group uh, uh, in Perth in, in Australia, that I'm involved with them now thinking about the indicators that they have to define open knowledge institutions. And I'm really interested in what is the way that we are going to reinvent the universities thinking that there is no rankings anymore and the openness is the new way to make the universities reinvented. And also in, in technical terms, we are dealing in open knowledge graphs, which is the, the new way to understand the interconnections and linking information. We have been thinking on open air linking uh, information through open knowledge graphs. We can think about the open knowledge graph of Google, and this is something that we have to deal with. And also we are thinking on open knowledge labs, new spaces. The open knowledge is getting new spaces. Even the maker spaces, the, the, the media labs, all these kind of new structures that the libraries are very comfortable with, they are part of this open knowledge approach. It's dealing with even spaces and giving to the researchers new scenarios to do research with new methodologies. And of course, the open knowledge is giving also us new uh, titles for things, even the Open Access Week that is still called like the Northern Times Open Access Week is dealing with uh, foundations of open knowledge. This is the, the call for proposals for Open Access Week in 2018. But when I see this uh, vision to implementation, the first thing I remind is again, again, from vision to implementation, this is where we were dealing with Amsterdam call for action. I don't know if you remember in 2016 with the, with the Dutch presidency in the, of the council organized this conference about open science. And it was very much engaged. And at the end of the day, at the end of the thing, we were thinking, on, and you, what are you going to do? So what is your particular implementation of open science? So we have been thinking on implementing open science now on implementing open knowledge or whatever for five years and what have been happening in these last five years. This is the reflection that I want to bring you today here from the perspective of where we are. In these five last five years, we have different recommendations, different status, different principles. We all agree with the principles, even in the European Open Science Policy Platform, we came up with these um, um, prioritizing recommendations, we call them, or Open Science Policy Platform Rex recommendations, that we deal with the eight main pillars of the open science, and we try to make uh, different recommendations at the stakeholder level. But again, recommendations and principles that we all agree upon that. And also the, the principles that we were dealing with, they are the Fed data, the European Open Science Cloud infrastructures, the new ways to uh, communicate um, uh, science, the new ways to scholarly communication, uh, the future of scholarly communication, next generation metrics, rewards and incentives, research integrity, education and skills, and citizen science, that they are all the elements that I put under my mushroom, under the umbrella, the key components we will see. But at the end, we all know that the, the bottleneck is the reward and incentive system. So we come up with different uh, answers at a stakeholder level. I remember perfectly that Lieber gave also an answer to the recommendations of the OSPP. We made the recommendations to the European uh, uh, Council, uh, the, the Competitiveness Council with the ministries at the member state level, but no very much change. 
So that's why I say that we need to talk again. If, if I told you something and you didn't change, something is wrong or with the message is not enough insistent. So the, the challenges that we had at the moment are the challenges that we have now. The point is that the challenges of open science and open knowledge are at the same time they're building blocks. So the point I think we have evolved pretty much in infrastructures. We have been doing moving on from the European Open Science Cloud. But yesterday I was attending an event of Ferris Fair, one of the projects that I'm involved in. And we were talking about what is going to be really full-fledged European, European Open Science Infrastructure for Research Data 2020. That was the target, 2030, 2025, to be uh, more uh, um, positive. It's very difficult to create from scratch a new infrastructure that is going to deal with so many issues that are related with uh, open data. And also the, 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 the question of embedding open science in the society, I think we have also evolved pretty much on citizen science. And I will let you know what is going on in incentives uh, before. But you have seen probably one million times, this is my favorite slide, which is the motivators of will, why the researchers we moved because of grants, because of different um, legislations. For example, we signed a grant agreement with the commission in a project. This is something that we are committed to, but also in the universities and the university libraries know about this because many of the universities are dealing with rankings and positions and stuff. This is something that is really important for researchers. But the other thing that is important for researchers when we do research is the seduction. It's what I call the WhatsApp effect. And open science and open science infrastructures, they said they should be seductive by default. That means that they have to be very easy. They have to be a, a way of motivation. We need help. We need help from the librarians. But also we need a way to give credit and to be recognized for the use of those um, platforms. If we deposit uh, our papers in our repository, we need to get credit for that. If we are entitled to deposit our research data in a, in a distributed infrastructure, in a federated infrastructure like Open Science Cloud, that would be necessary that I get some motivation to do so. Because if not, what I want to do is my research. I, I don't want to do all these kind of works that they are related with the open knowledge commitment. And also let's researchers believe and enjoy on open knowledge. But this is the, the crucial reality. This is one of the slides that I use with my PhD <laughs> students in the university. And sometimes you have these this, uh, directions to, to, to go. What is the direction that you want to go? Of course, you want to be an open scientist because the young generations, the early career researchers, they are in this, in this kind of field. But the, the real way to have a career and to develop a career in science is that. So in the final report of the Open Science Policy Platform last year, we, uh, re we, we gather instead of recommendations, practical commitments for implementations. The PCIs are these kind of commitments that we, with our own shoes in our own institutions, we can say that we can do. For example, you are a librarian. What can you do for open science? Perhaps you can create uh, a new uh, infrastructure to help your researchers uh, better uh, performance of open science. Or perhaps you can set up a new a mechanism to make the workflow of deposit of uh, data easier. I'm a researcher, what can I do for open science? Perhaps I cannot change the policy of the whole world, but perhaps I can change my own policy. And as soon as I publish a paper, I will produce um, uh, a deposit uh, workflow on my own thinking. So that's the point that what can I do? Or well, for example, the commission, the commission is a policymaker, but also as a founder, the founders, they just uh, get the plan S that I'm not very supportive of plan S, but it is the first uh, practical commitment for implementation from the perspective of the, of the founders. What can you do in your real perspective? So the libraries uh, lever answer to the, to this final report. And uh, we, we gather all the, the progress on open science in a practical level in a commitment level and in an actionable level of the things that we have done in the last uh, years. But also we want to share something on the next step of the new system 
of shared research knowledge. knowledge. And then COVID came and COVID changed or re make us rethink the way we do open science. And this is the point where the OECD just uh, recommend why the, the, the COVID-19 response um, is, a, is a call for, for thinking on the policymakers and also is a commitment for the researchers, it's a commitment even for the, it's challenging even the, the, the IPR and industrial law and how to share uh, the collaborative science to make the things and to make solving problems. And also the crucial thing that the OECD was uh, uh, asking the, the, the policymakers to do is also incentivize researchers to do science in the open and in the collaborative way. In this sense, they appear millions of publications, some of them so challenging like Open Science Save Lives. Uh, I would like to think so, but yesterday I was in a discussion about metadata and we have this thing, metadata save lives. This is a very nice, uh, a very nice uh, sentence when you are engaged with this topic, but probably it is too high level sentence, but it's something like a new, a new way to think that uh, we need really open knowledge to, to have, uh, to challenge this new, um, uh, new problems that we have coming up. But also we, we did a study because, you know, at the end, the publications are the things of the, the main things of the researcher. We can talk about citizen science and collaborative and co-creation, but at the end of the day, we have to publish and the things that really are effective or you can, when you can do a meta research to think what is going on is about um, the publications. So I made a study with some colleagues in the in the Basque country in Spain, and we analyzed at the beginning five, uh, almost 6,000 publications in open access to analyze where it was the kind of open access that they have. Because all these publishers, they say, no, we are going to open everything up. It's a, a specific uh, time. But at the end of the day, we discovered that much, much of, the, of the publications, they are published in bronze open access, and that means that it's just kind of um, an open access, but not good open access, no licensing. So the point is that um, it's kind of a fake open access. It's kind of a fake moment to uh, discuss also this, um, this uh, poor quality of research. Um, the preprint is, has been uh, analyzed and discussed. If this is a real discussion moment if COVID-19 has been good for open science or not. I think it has been a real explanation for the society. Mm, uh, the society needs a generous and a transparent and collaborative research, full stop, because we need solutions quickly. But the other thing is that we are just um, not having a plan for this. It's just open it up, open it up, whatever it is, and just make it happen. And then we will see if we can close again. So this is a very difficult um, uh, solution. But uh, let me think now um, where we are now after five years of mm, climbing for action, five years of thinking that we are implementing something and where, where we want to be. In the final report of the OSPP, that is something that I really want to underline today because I think it's just kind of... Uh, wrap up of a period of uh, what it was uh, happening in the commission in the last five years with the previous commissioner. Now we have a new commissioner, we have a new uh, research program, Horizon Europe, and we have to think further. So even if I don't like this declaration mode or this recommendation mode, what we did in the OSPP on top of creating these uh, reflections about the open science coordination in the world that we are really thinking on internationalization and we are very happy about the engagement of the UNESCO Working Group on the recommendations because really, really address what we have been working in, in the OSPB. And also, uh, we want to uh, create this shared research knowledge system, including these five attributes. That, for example, the academic area structure should be uh, um, based on the behavior to maximize the contribution to a shared research knowledge system. And also the research system should be reliable, transparent, and trustworthy. 
The point that is that we are discussing now uh, a bit if open science and the COVID is good or bad for the science, that sometimes people are reluctant to believe on science because of this preprint of this fake effect of the publication on almost 100,000 publications about COVID in the last year. So uh, the point is that if science demonstrates that it is reliable, transparent and trustworthy, this is a, a new opportunity that we have to, to let people embrace scientific outcomes and scientific approaches. The point is that um, perhaps we are losing an opportunity to make the system reliable and we are losing an opportunity to uh, improve the trustworthiness based on the openness. What I always say is that openness is a clear, um, is a clear call for quality. What happened, for example, in the COVID situation with the, the paper appeared in The Lancet about the ibuprofen, that they say that um, it was kind of a, a bad thing for COVID, blah, blah, blah. In three days, the, the community, the, the scientific community, just, uh, just really correct the whole effect of that bullshit in, in the communication. If this paper is on the prayer worlds, it will never be put it on the light of the media, for example. So that's why I want to say that openness is a real call for uh, quality, because if it is not a quality enough, it will be just destroyed by the, by the collective knowledge and the collective community. And also uh, the research system should enable innovation because it was a topic that in the OSPP we never addressed properly the innovation and the valorization of science in the openness, which is a tricky situation. And that's why I'm now analyzing very much the point of the IPR issues and what is going to the trade uh, laws and all these things related with the innovation and the creation of new values for, uh, for knowledge. And also uh, we thought about it, the open science is not only, or the open knowledge is not only a way to, to communicate science, it's a way of having equity and diversity. Diversity is one of the issues that uh, the, the UNESCO declaration, the UNESCO recommendations are addressing more um, uh, deeply because it's kind of a way to make the, the sustainable development goal number 10, that is not leave anybody behind, put it on the middle of the open science and open knowledge behavior. And also we need to have a research system that is built on evidence base and policy and practice. That's why I'm so engaged now on meta research. But at this point, sometimes you think that we only change the target. Look at this uh, cartoon that is very fun. Before the great subscription crash on 2017, we thought about that it will happen in 2017. Then we changed the date and uh, Robert Jenny Smith came up with the plan S and we thought about 2020. And we say, no, 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 2020 is too early. Let's put 2021. But now we are talking about the openness of publications. Just again, coming back, reducing open science again to open access, 2030. But then came COVID and the reality is always more... <laughs> more impactful than the fiction. So the COVID-19 really put um, um, a line to sum up what we are going to do in open science. And the urgent change are the way we communicate, not only papers, give credit for something else, the way we measure science, the journal impact factor, and the way we give credit to the researchers and how we acknowledge the work is not only about copyright, we need to have an evolution of the rights protection that make open science happen. And also we have alliances. One of the alliances is the new European research area that was presented in the 30th of uh, September. And it gathers one of the key issues in the new European research area to have a new research uh, uh, reward system. So that's a very good news. And also Horizon Europe, because the grant agreement, which is the, what I say to you, one of the motivators of will, when you sign, in the articles uh, 11 and 12, no, uh, 12, 11, 10 and 12, 10 and 11, they address completely the opportunities to guarantee that the beneficiaries, they 
keep the intellectual property rights that they need to comply with the requirements and the obligation of access from data and for um, uh, publications. And also on the Horizon Europe, this is an evolution. This is a, a presentation from the European Commission Unit of Open Science. It's a, a way how we have evolved in the requirements. And the point, the most interesting thing in Horizon Europe that is studying this year is that uh, the open science starts at the proposal time. It's not about the open access. It's not about the, the outcomes. It's about the proposal mode, because we are going to evaluate the research uh, proposals. Open access and open science and, and the engagement of the citizens in the research, not only at the end of the project, ex, ex post, we are going to evaluate open science and proposal mode in the excellence, in the methodology, and also in the efficiency of implementation. Because the beneficiaries, the consortia that they apply for European funding, they have to demonstrate that they have open science skills in the way they perceive, and also in the way that they, they, they have methodologies, that they are collaborative enough, that they use enough infrastructures, that they use uh, the, in the right way data, as open as possible always. And also, uh, they will have this, uh, this challenge of making the, the data fair in the whole life cycle process, because the research uh, data management plan is a deliverable, but you have to update it all over the research um, uh, um, process. So this is uh, an, a very good alliance that we are, um, they are including more than open science, uh, more than open access uh, elements. And also the citizen science will be evaluated in the methodological approach. And also the commission is given also enablers to, to do this. One is the Open Research Europe, the new infrastructure that uh, the, the commission is putting on, um, on, on the purpose of making easier life for researchers. And also publishing here is a peer review, um, open peer review platform. Uh, publishing here uh, is the best way to be an open scientist because it, it means that if you're publishing here, you have a European project that means a collaborative uh, approach to do research in a consortium. It means that you have approved that project in an excellence and competitive framework. It means that you have a peer review openly available that everybody can check the peer review. And also it means that it's a legitimation of the whole open access system because to publish here, it doesn't mean that you are avoiding to publish in the green open access repository because it's always the goal open access, the diamond open access, whatever, doesn't mean that you don't have the right and the obligation to publish in your own repository. So this is a legitimation of the, the whole open science process and how you can become an open scientist. And in the, in the land of the infrastructures as enablers of making this happen, the European Commission is also making a big investment in the European Open Science Cloud. When making for data is becoming the, the rule, and it's very nice to say findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, but this is a very, very challenging thing. Make data fair is not a question of magic. The uh, fair principles are not the standards, uh, um, are principles, and it's uh, about having a technical perspective and a lot of planning and a lot of uh, uh, interoperability issues, and they are metadata, are really challenging for the next future of science in this open science cloud context and open data, um, an open data partnership. And also, there are two new key topics that I want to uh, uh, pay attention. One of them is reproducibility. The reproducibility is something that is embed, embed in the new uh, ethical system that we need. And it's kind of a connotation of open science by default, but we have never addressed it properly. Yesterday, our keynote speaker in Liver, uh, Toma, that is the, the director of uh, DARIA, you know, the DARIA is the big infrastructure for um, humanities, and it's coming along with, uh, with the other um, big infrastructures and S3s and ERICs in Europe. Toma was saying that. Um, 
that um, the digital libraries can play a role in the reproducibility of the digital scholarships in the cultural heritage. This is something that makes me think about it because sometimes you think that rep reproducibility is something that happened in the pre-registration of the projects at the psychological research and medical science and these kind of things. But also it's a question that could uh, come with the cultural heritage research, which is very, very much needed and very much led by the libraries. And also another issue that is address addressed in the European research area and the horizon 2030 as these new two um, alliances that we are uh, generating for this new approach of open science in the, in the future is the new research assessment. Uh, now, um, the Open Science Policy Platform finished its mandate in, in May last year, but now we have created a stakeholders forum for the main issue of this stakeholders forum is reform and research assessment. And it's something that I say to the European Commission that I'm really, really thankful because the European Commission as a policymaker or as a funder, they could just go in the research assessment in their tiptoes and say, mm, this is not my business. This is about institutions. It's about researchers and uh, research evaluation agencies. It's not my problem. But they are really dealing with this issue and they want really to change the modus operandi of science and trying to make them the uh, the reward system uh, an incentivized system that is based on the qualitative and quantitative metrics what we call responsible research uh, assessment or responsible research metrics and this is supposed to conclude in um in a memorandum of understanding with the different stakeholders with the um, with the uh, research performing organizations, probably with the libraries because we are the system and, and also with the funders and also with some of the key uh, agencies in, in the member states that they are going to uh, do the research um, uh, incentives and the evaluation of the career assessment because this is the crucial issue that make these things happen. Also, as you know, uh, DORA uh, declaration is very much on the international sphere of these kind of uh, research incentives, farther away than quantitative metrics. But also uh, this is kind of a memorandum of understanding that I will say that is uh, a bit more farther away than a, just a declaration. The principles, they are very clear. We all agree upon that the impact factor is not gonna be the da 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 da, -da. We all agree that we can change the system, but at the end of the day, we keep doing the same. So this is a, a very good news for the system. And I'm really happy that the libraries, we can engage with the, with the researchers to make a common, um, a common front of the new reward system. But let me um, just uh, finish. I think we have 10 minutes to go. I would like to have a discussion with you guys. And I would like to have a discussion about why you lever address embrace open knowledge as speaker term of open science um, in terms of including open education and in terms of including all the sciences, social sciences and humanities, or why is this open knowledge approach possible? This is something that I would like to, to discuss. But also let me just uh, um, underline some takeaways and conclusions. If we are thinking in the new step of open knowledge, open science in 2030, which is the new target, is what I said to you, we change the target, we don't get the objective, so we change the target. Uh, this is uh, something that I want to, to think over, the things that they are not resolved yet. For example, the, the, I think the cartoon is very, is very interesting because probably it sounds too familiar. Um, do the publishers smoke us? Yes, they do. Is the answer. My university cannot afford journal subscription anymore. Um, I completely subscribe. And I think the transformative agreements are not the solution, not anymore. I mean, it's just changing well, when we put the money, not if we can make a better science openly available, and if we can make more uh, uh, research communication uh, bigger and more reproducible and more uh, openly and also including other research outcomes like methodologies and, and codes and, and, and algorithms and, and something more than the publication. Also the reward system, which is the thing that I was really, really 
uh, engaging in this talk. The peer review, in my opinion, should be open. Um, they, I have been discussing this with a lot of researchers and panels of evaluation in Spain and the researchers, they don't really like to have open review, but I think it's fantastic. It's a way of, uh, I have an open review in one of these uh, publications that I have done recently. And I say to one of the reviewers, I want to put you as a co-author because your review is so rich in the open that enrich my paper so much. So this is uh, up to the researcher. That's why I say to you that you have to talk. Darling, we need to talk with the researchers. And also the publication of the data, not only FAIR, because FAIR doesn't mean that they are reproducible. FAIR is a, a, a characteristic, a feature with the data set itself. But the, the reproducibility is about the, 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 making, uh, the making of, of the whole research project. It's further away than making the data fair. And also education, 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 education. It's incredible how many false friends, their researchers, we have sometimes. Oh, so um, open science, this is about paying for publishing only, right? No, this is about citizen science, about methodologies, about one million things. But I mean, let me tell you what I think is going to be the open knowledge um, system in the near future, in the next 19 years, is what I call the RR ISA mode. RR because it's uh, always something that is in the, in the key acronyms that we are dealing with always. And ISA because it's the acrostic acronym that happened, it's the new standard. Responsible research and innovation, which is the land of the transparency and the openness growing. The rights retention strategy, which is something that is not an invention of the planets, it's a real right for the researchers. It's really a, a, a clear um, retention of our own uh, um, property of the knowledge that we produce. And the third RR is the responsible research assessment and the responsible research metric, which is a new mechanism to make things happen. And this is a takeaway for librarians. You need a Swiss knife. You need a swift knife and you need to just juggle with all these new challenges that you have in the open education, citizen science, open knowledge and openness kingdom that is the new ecosystem where we have to deal with the profession of library science. And that's why I want to change my mushroom in a parachute because science is like a parachute. If it is not open, is not going to help us. We should give back the society, the science we do, to have the future we want. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very keen to answer the questions that you have. Thank you. Um, I think Agnes is mute. OK. Um, oh, you are, you are. OK, good. OK, thank you, Eva. Uh, very interesting uh, speech about open science, open knowledge, and the challenges uh, we all together face, and uh, the difficulty of implementing ideas that uh, paradigm, uh, the, the, the shift of this uh, open science paradigm is, is quite uh, complicated. But uh, I think we have uh, two questions from the audience. And uh, the first one uh, is uh, that one. Can you elaborate more on the revolution of the copyright system that is needed to make open science happen? <laughs> it's often mentioned, but uh, usually discussed in a very vague mode. So what does it mean in concrete? That's a very good question. And I think it's one of the bottlenecks that we never think about. I was analyzing all the open science reports in the last five years, and only three or four of them, they mention copyright. And always just in a very vague way. When I see, when I think that we need a, a revolution, I think we have um, we need to um, give credit in another way. 
I'm not a, a lawyer. Um, I have been working with a lawyer lately in these IPR issues and the, all the intellectual property um, rights, that is not only the copyright. And we came up with this idea that we need exactly to have a new mechanism to give credit without giving uh, away our knowledge, our rights to, to, to share knowledge. Because at the end, it's the same thing that we have the right to, to have knowledge and be a, a knowledge for that, but we don't have the right to share it. And this is when it comes with the uh, data, it's very funny because um, the data are like the facts. I remember that I was working with Liber in the, the Hague Declaration, and I remember that we thought about that facts and data, they don't have copyright in general. But if you come to the, the sui generis law in the, in the European system, which is always demanded by, by for example, for the Americans, so they say, no, this European, they have this sui generis law, where the, the data in a database, they have a sui generis protection. So this is something that is going to be reviewed now, but I, I'm not sure if it is the, the big revolution that we need, but actually in the, in the kingdom of the openness, we need the um, uh, rights, the intellectual property rights of the exclusion of the, of the um, and the, also we need having different corrections and, 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 and kinds of uh, agree on the whole thing of the whole system working again. Because when you want to the openness, you bump into the, the copyright and you bump into the, um, the intellectual, um, I'm sorry, the property rights. So this is kind of uh, being in a, in a very um, jail, you know. So um, I think it's needed to review that and it's something that it hasn't been addressed enough. Okay, thanks. We have another question, which is very... Uh, uh, a very practical question, and uh, it says, uh, what incentives uh, have you implemented at your institutions to get researchers excited about open science? So that's a very, that's a very good question because I'm working right now in my institution about uh, this thing. And, and instead of, of uh, making a policy, a full-fledged policy, from bottom up, uh, I'm sorry, top down. I'm just working on the bottom up approach. I'm trying to, to make the researchers confident with the openness, uh, giving, uh, giving them this seduction mode, which is creating an open science unit, that the library is part of the unit and that uh, give them help, which is one of the motivators that you have, you need help. And the other thing is the belief that, um, that open it up is not a way to pay for money, uh, pay for publishing. Uh, it's not a way of predatory journals. Uh, what I have been doing is training, 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 training. This is my mantra today. Training, 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 bottom up approaches and pilots of becoming full open science research teams in a way that they come up to these uh, proposals and say, well, in the implementation and the consortium as a whole, we can provide that we have been entitled with my university full open science um, uh, research teams. So this is a convincement. It's probably a slower, but when people are convinced, it's very easy to make a policy. If you do the mandate and nobody reads the mandate, it's not a, a anything. And also we have not very much motivation, me motivation mechanisms at institutional level, because in Spain, Agnes knows that this is centralized, the, the research evaluation is centralized at national level. But also um, we are trying to do our incentives, something like um, uh, in the in the complement of the of the university research complement, you can uh, you you are sort of obliged to deposit all your publications, full stop deposit, and have at least openly available two of them. This is nothing, you know, but it's a way of thinking about it. It's very it's very just uh, put it in put it in the regulations of the motivation something is a way that makes th people think about it. I always remember one of my colleagues and my researchers when I was doing my PhD, that she came once to my office and said, 
what is this thing of the journal impact factor? I'm a researcher in uh, Latin American literature. What is that? And you know what she was interested about? Because it appears in the criteria. So as soon as it appears in the criteria for this complement, open access and green and deposit, compare deposit 100% of metadata and 80% of the publications. What is this? So people just think about that. Education, education, education is the best the best way to promote open science. So thank you very much, Iba. Uh, now it's 10.01, so we have to close the session. And we have still one pending uh, question, but maybe we can answer it uh, by, by email. And uh, thank you for uh, the attendees. Uh, it, it's been a very compelling and challenging talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Have a nice and successful conference. And happy birthday again for the conference. Mm -hmm. Thank you.